Good morning. Every now and then as I am reading the Bible, there's a certain word or a phrase that catches my attention. It's as if God wants me to take special notice. So he keeps bringing it before me over and over again. Recently, the word abide or the idea of abiding kept popping up in the scriptures that I was reading. Abiding means to constantly remain. God himself constantly remains with us. He has ever since he created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We were in his thoughts even before we were created. And even before we were born, he knit each one of us together in our mother's womb. Psalm 9, 7 to 10 says, The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne of judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. To never forsake is another way of saying constantly abide. He remains our stronghold, ever present in times of trouble. Just as it says in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. I don't know about you, but I often turn to that verse for comfort, especially when things aren't going very well. I remembered it this past week while I was praying for Karen and Carvel. It's in times of trouble that we most realize our need for God. That is when we recognize his abiding faithfulness to us and we feel his presence more strongly as we deal with our own helplessness. God's love abides, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 100 verse 5. Love is proof that God abides in us. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John 4, 9 through 16. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the Lord or into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. <coughs> According to, the, to verse number 15 in that passage, God lives in anyone who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. And in verse 16 it says that God abides or lives in those who love. And then verse 19 sums it all up by saying we love because he first loved us. Love is proof 
that God constantly remains in us. He abides. It's also important to remember that God's word abides. Everything began with God's word. In Genesis, at the creation of the universe and everything in it, God spoke and it was so. His word called everything into being. And John reaffirms it in John 1, 1 to 3. He writes, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made that were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. You will notice that the word is called he and him. That is because Jesus is the living word. Jesus was there at the beginning helping to create. And then, when the time was right, verse 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Not only did everything begin with God's word, but there is no end to it. We are born again through the living and enduring word of God. According to 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25, all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. It is not to be changed or tampered with or have anything added to it or taken away from its prophecy. Just as the word abides, we are to abide in God's word. Abiding in his word makes us true disciples. John 8, 31 and 32 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Abiding in God's word bears fruit, and it causes us to love as he loved. Abiding in his word means keeping his commandments and believing in his son and becoming true followers of Christ. John writes in 1 John 2, 3-6 about the importance of abiding in the word. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. This is how we know that we are abiding in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. When Jesus tells us in John 15 that he is the vine and we are the branches, he explains that in order to live and bear fruit, we have to constantly remain in him. In other words, we have to abide in him. Because without him, we can do nothing. Our Father God is the gardener. And if we do not bear fruit, we will be like the dead branch that withers and is pruned away and thrown into the fire. Abiding in Jesus, the vine, makes us productive in our witnessing and in leading others to Christ, in serving, in sharing, in loving others, just as Jesus loves. So what does abiding in Christ look like in your life? Do you wake up in the morning and ask Jesus, what do you have for me to do today? Who can I serve? How can I be a blessing to someone today? Do you seek his guidance for every decision you make? Do you spend some time in his word and in prayer? Do you take him with you everywhere you go? even to work? As Debbie Reichenbach told us in her sermon last week, serving Christ is not just about the things that we do for him. It is also being aware of the things that we neglect to do for him. 
the opportunities that we miss because we are too busy. We are focused on ourselves rather than on Christ. And Debbie's not here today, but Stuart, you can tell her that by Monday I had already had to ask for forgiveness for a missed opportunity. <laughs> and that her sermon immediately came to mind as soon as I did it, or should I say, didn't do it. So thank, thank her for that sermon. <laughs> Abiding in Christ is a two-way street. While God constantly remains in us, we need to abide in him and his son. That means that we remain constant. Trusting Jesus through the good times and the bad. He does not promise that we will not have trouble. Only that he will be there to go through it with us. Abiding in Christ has benefits. It means that Jesus will call us friends. And he will make everything that he has learned from his Father known to us. It means that Jesus has chosen us to be fruit bearers of the kind of fruit that will last forever. The more that we abide in him, the more uh, his love perfects us and it gives us confidence in the day of judgment. It means that our prayers will be heard and answered if we remain in him. Our joy will be complete and our fears will decrease. So what are the consequences of not abiding in Christ? Those who do not abide cannot hear or understand the word of God because the meaning just won't be revealed to them. I recently had a conversation with a young woman, a mother of two children. I didn't know her. We had just met. She asked if I had any hobbies. We were just making conversation and she asked if I had any hobbies and I told her, well, I, I like to quilt and I like to read and study my Bible. She said that she had a Bible. She's always wanted to read it through cover to cover at least once in her lifetime. But she said she got to the big names and she got to the people who lived to be a 500 and all those laws and she just couldn't understand it. She lost interest. She just couldn't understand what she was reading. So she put it aside. I realized as she was talking that she didn't understand it because she didn't know the author. Before we parted company, I suggested that she try reading the Bible again, but that she start with the Gospel of John. I said that John was the story of Jesus and why he came. And if she got to know him, the rest of the Bible would make more sense to her. She said, well, maybe she would try that. And I sure hope that she does. Not only for her sake, but for her children's sake. In John 8, 47, he says, He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. And those who practice sin do not abide in God. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Those who do not abide in Christ will not see eternal life. They will be barred from the tree of life and they may not enter the gates of the city, the new Jerusalem. Instead, they will be thrown into the fire and burned as a dead branch is burned. The good news is that when we abide in Christ, we constantly remain in him the Holy Spirit comes and abides in us. He's evidence of Christ's presence. He teaches us how to remain in Christ, how to testify and witness for him. And he seals us as one of Christ's chosen. Today is the beginning of Advent, 
the time that we prepare our hearts to receive the Christ child, the promised Messiah. He left the beautiful halls of heaven to come down to earth, to become flesh, and to abide with us. All he asks in return is that we abide with him. Abiding is much more than a once a week commitment. It's an everyday relationship that Jesus wants to have with us. As you anticipate the celebration of Christ's birth, I hope you will also commit to making your home in him. Abide with him. That's why he came.